The Goblin and the Dragon Once upon a time, there was a goblin called Crookie, and he was just like his name. As crooked a goblin as ever lived in little town. He didn't tell the truth. He took sound strong for other people, and he was the worst telltale of anyone could imagine. No one liked him, no one smiled at him, and no one asked him out to tea. Crookie hadn't a single friend and didn't want one. He was only welcomed by witches because he captured prisoners for them to make into servants. He was well paid for that, and he was very rich. On the hill behind the town was a deep cave. In this cave lived Goku the dragon. He was quite harmless, but once in a while he would get terribly hungry. Then all the pixies and brownies and goblins kept out of his way till he was fed by the cart full of bananas that the Lord High Chamberlain, Chamberlain sent him as soon as he knew the dragon was hungry again. It was said that Goofo might forget his likings for bananas and eat the pixie if one was near in time. Cookie often saw the dragon because the goblin's house was near the cave, but Goofo didn't like Cookie at all and wouldn't speak to him. He knew that he was a bad goblin, and even dragons liked to choose their friends. This made Cookie very cross, and he was always trying to get Goofo to be friendly with him, so that he might be able to say, The dragon asked me to tea in his cave, or the dragon had a picnic with me yesterday, as the others little folk did. But Goofo turned his head away and sniffed loudly whenever Cookie came near, and wouldn't have anything to do with him at all. Now one day, he went to a meeting to hear what arrangements were being made to greet the king when he came in an early visit to town. A pixie and an elf began to quarrel, and all the others tried to stop them. Be quiet, Flip, cried the brownies. You look as ugly as the old dragon when you frown like that. Don't lose your temper, Gobble, cried the pixies to the elf. You will grow as ugly as a dragon if you do. Now, as soon as Cookie heard them calling out these things, a plan came into his mind. Suppose he went to tell the dragon the little folk called him ugly. Surely Goofo wouldn't be pleased with him and would be so angry with the other folk that he would go into the town and eat them all up. Then he and Goofo would be friends. Now that's a good idea of mine, said Goofy to himself, and he slipped into the meeting hall to think about it. I will be pretend to be very pleased to think that anyone could call Goofo ugly, and I will tell him he is beautiful and that he should punish those who think otherwise. He will be my friend after that. Everything will be lovely. So the very next day, Cookie started out to the dragon's cave. Google was lying out in the sun having a sunbathe. He was not beautiful. Indeed, he was really very ugly, but he had scales all over his body and a long spiky tail, and when he breathed, smoke came out of his nose. Hello, Google, said Cookie, in a very cheerful voice. Hello, Google, said Cookie. I say, I've got something to tell you. You will be surprised to hear it. It's something I've heard about you, and you won't be a bit pleased. As I feel very friendly towards you, I thought it my duty to tell you. Goofo said nothing. He yawned very white, then shut his eyes, and then, quite suddenly, he felt terribly hungry. Once every fifty days, he felt like that, and it just happened to be the fiftieth day that morning. He wondered whether the Lord High Chamberlain was sending his bananas, but it wasn't the Lord High Chamberlain, and had, he had made a mistake, and thought that it was the, only the 49th day, and the bananas didn't come. Could be the goblin didn't know what to, what to do. He went quite near to the dragon and spoke to him once more. Do listen, Google, he said. I have something surprising to tell you. What do you think of this? And Google put his paw behind his ear and pretended that he had heard everything that was said. Come nearer, he said. I'm deaf in one ear. I can't hear. Come nearer, Cookie. So Cookie came nearer. Sit on the end of my tail, Cookie. I'm terribly deaf this morning. So the little telltale sat on the end of his spiky tail and began to speak again. People down in little town say that you are very ugly, and I think you ought to eat people that say things like that. Goofo pretended he still couldn't hear. Sit on my back, he said. There's a buzzing in my ears. So Cookie sat on his garden's back and began to shout. One ear's dead and the other's no good, he said. Sit on my head, Crookie, sit on my head. So Crookie sat on the dragon's head and began to shout again. Sit on my big front tooth, Crookie, sit on my big front tooth. So Crookie sat on the dragon's front tooth and then Google opened his mouth very wide, jerked his head back and shut his teeth with a snap. Are you 
was Cookie. He'd gone. The dragon smiled a big smile and felt that he could wait for his bananas now for ever so long. Ho oh, there, brownies, he cried. Come here a moment. Cookie had been here telling me that you were very ugly. I hope that it is true. You do think I'm ugly, don't you? Of course we do, said the brownies. We have always told you so, Goofle. There isn't such a thing as a beautiful dragon. I thought so, Goofle said with a pleased sigh. That stupid Cookie called me beautiful that made me feel so angry I couldn't bear to be your beautiful dragon. Where is Cookie now, said the brownies, looking round. We will scold him for trying to tell tales. And the dragon looked red and from his head. Well, you see, he said, Cookie sat on my big front tooth. And when I opened my mouth, he fell down my throat. And I'm afraid you won't see him anymore. Good gracious, cried the brownies in a fright. Why, it must be the fiftieth day. We must go and see about your bananas. And off they scurried and sent a message to the High Lord Chamberlain, begging him to send the bananas at once. Then they went to tell the news about Cookie to everyone in little town. Nobody said they were sorry, and nobody said they were glad. But little town was bed all so much nicer after Cookie had gone. As for Goofo, the dragon, he ate up every one of his bananas and then went to sleep very happy. John's Hanky It was very, very hot. Mother told the two children that they really must put on their sun hats when they went to play in the garden. After dinner, they sat on the hot garden seat with their books. Alice had on her sun hat. John had forgotten his, and he felt the sun burning his head. Brother, he said to himself, I don't want to have to go all the way into the house to fetch my hat. I know what I'll do. I'll knot my hat at each corner and make a nice little sun cap of it. So he took out his big hanky from his pocket and knotted it carefully in each corner, and then he set it on his head and took up his book to read. His bookmark flew into the rose bushes after a bit, and John got up to get it, and he scratched his hand badly on the rose thorn and gave a yell. Oh, look at that! It's bleeding like anything. I must bind it up at once. It wasn't there, of course. He put his hand into his shirt. But he hadn't tucked it in there either. He looked on the seat and on the ground, but no hanky. Don't fidget, said Alice, I'm reading. Lend me your hanky then, I've hurt my hand, said John. And Alice looked at him, then she laughed. Use your own, she said. But I haven't got it, said John crossly. Yes, you have, said Alice. No, I haven't, said John. You tell me where it is, if you think you know, and I shall use it. Shan't, said Alice, and laughed again. And then John got cross and smacked her. She fell off the seat and yelled, and she grabbed John by the knees, and he fell off the seat too. Soon they were rolling over and over on the grass, shouting and rumbling about with each other. At last, John sat Alice hard on the ground. Now, you tell me where my hanky is, he said, or I'll sit on you even harder. No, it's on your head, silly, said Alice, and began to laugh. Oh dear, so it was. John did feel foolish and he went indoors and got his son half then. The Little Christmas Tree There was once a hill which was covered with fir trees. There were fine trees, tall and straight and always dressed in green. For they did not throw their leaves in autumn as other trees did. They were evergreens. We must grow as tall as we can, whispered the first fir to another. Tall, tall and straight. I want to be the mast of a ship when I shall always be the wind rocking me, said one fir. I want to be a telegraph post, said another. Then all day and night I shall hear the messages whispering along the wires. I would like to be a scaffolding pole, put up when new houses are built, said a fir, third fir tree. I am so very, very tall. So the trees talked to one another, all but one small tree which hadn't grown at all. The winter wind had once uprooted it, and it was nearly died. The woodman had replanted it, but it had never grown. It was a tiny tree, sad because it could no longer talk to its brothers and sisters. They are so high above me that they would not even hear my voice, said the little fir tree. It was frightening when the woodman came round. It knew that the other trees were proud to know they would be masts of ships or something grand and useful. But what use is such a tiny tree like me? 
One day I shall be chopped down and made into firewood, said the fir tree to itself. I'm no use at all. And one morning, sure enough, the woodman came and saw the tiny tree. He didn't chop it down, but he dug it up. The little tree was sad. Now this is the end of me, it thought. To its surprise, it was planted in a gay tub, which was painted bright red. And then all kinds of queer things happened to it. The woodman's wife hung strands of gay tinsel on its boughs. She bought bits of cotton wool here and there to make it look as though snow had been falling. And she looked at all the shining glass balls and tied them to the end of the branches. The tree is looking really lovely, she said. How pleased the children will be. Then she fastened twenty small and beautiful coloured candles. Red, pink, yellow, blue and green. All over the tree. She tied a pretty fairy doll on top. She hung toys here and there. And the tree was so astonished that it hardly knew what to think. On Christmas Day, the mother gave the little tree to her children. And they clapped their hands with joy. Mother, mother, it's a Christmas tree. Oh, mother, it's the loveliest tree you've ever had. The little fir tree was glad. It was happy to give pleasure to so many. Even if I am used to a would now, I shan't mind, it thought. But after Christmas, the woodman took the tree from its tub and planted it in the garden round the back of the cottage. It's just right for a Christmas tree, he said. We'll have it for our Christmas tree every year. Sly the Squirrel Gets a Shock Sly the Squirrel was a main creature. He always got the best nuts for himself and the very nicest toadstools. And he wouldn't let the nut hatch birds have a single one of his nuts in the hazel tree where he lived. And if he caught the little dormouse taking one of the, off the ground, he would bend down and chatter at him angrily. They're my nuts! They're my nuts! They're not, said the dormouse. You ask the hazel tree. They grow for anyone. The squirrel is a meanie. The squirrel is a meanie, sang the hatch. Not hatch. He whistled loud and long. Sly is his name. Sly is by nature. Some little rooted who sometimes liked a nut himself. Nobody likes the squirrel. Nobody likes the squirrel, squeaked the field mouse, popping his head up from a hole under the roots of the pine tree. The squirrel stared, stared angrily around. It wasn't nice to have things shouted about him like that, and he was very much annoyed. He bounded away to the top of the tree. It was late autumn, and there were many nuts hanging on the boughs. The squirrel picked one and bit it with his sharp teeth. He gnawed a hole in the nut to get the sweet kernel. But the kernel inside was not sweet. It was very bitter, and the squirrel spat it out. A bad nut, he said. There are such a lot of them this year. I wish the nut hatch bird and the mice would get all the bad nuts, and then I could get all the good ones. That would serve them right from being so mean to me. As he sat and nibbled at a good nut, an idea came into his head. I know what I'll do. I'll gather all the bad nuts I can find and put them into a pile, and I'll tell the nut hatch and the mice I've picked them for a present for them. And they will be sorry they called me rude names. And will think I'm a fine fellow. But what a shock they will get when in the middle of winter they all go to the store for the nuts and find they're all bad. The mean little squirrel began to hunt for the bad nuts and he knew that they had little holes in where the nut crop had bitten its way out. He put them all together in a pile at the foot of one of the hazel trees. Look at Sly the squirrel. He's piling up all the nuts for himself. And the squirrel overheld him. Those lovely nuts are not for myself, he said. They are for you and the dormouse and the field mouse. I don't want them, said the dormouse. I sleep all winter through. I'm eating nuts myself now to get my body fat, so I shall not be wanting anything to eat in the winter. It will soon be very cold anyway, and I will sleep in comfort all winter through. The nut hatch was surprised to hear that Sly the squirrel had collected nuts for others, not himself. Thank you, he said. I may visit the pile in the winter. I have plenty stored up for myself, said the field mouse, but maybe I'll find a few of your nuts useful. Thank you very much, the nut hatch and I will cover them with leaves. So he and the nut hatch covered up the big pile of bad nuts with leaves. Sly the squirrel grinned to himself. 
What a shock the rocket, he said. Now that night the frost came and it was very sudden indeed. It was terribly cold the next day and Sly woke up and looked out from his hole in the tree. I'd better go and find some nuts to store away, he said. And he put his nose out a bit further but the frost bit it. And he drew it in again quickly. Oh, how cold! I'll sleep a bit longer. He slept for more than a month, and when he did wake, he was dreadfully hungry. He leapt out of his hole into the winter sunshine. It was quite a warm day for winter time. He looked about for nuts, and the trees were quite bare. There were no leaves and no nuts, and then Sly remembered that he had had no time to store himself away any nuts at all. Oh my, I didn't put away any nuts for myself like I usually do. He sat hugging his little empty tummy, and then he saw the nuthatch bird flying by. Hi, nuthatch. Where are there any nuts? Nowhere, said the bird. The trees are bare. And then Sly saw the little dormouse. Hi, field mouse, he called. Have you any nuts stored up? Could you spare me a few? No, I've only got enough for myself and my family, said the mouse. Have you forgotten that lovely pile there under those dead leaves? Sly had forgotten all about them. Where are they, he said. You can have them all, said the mouse. They're just over there. So Sly bounded over to the pile and brushed aside the leaves and he cracked the nuts hungrily. But alas for the poor squirrel, every nut was bad, every single one. The little mouse ran up and the nut hatch flew down. What's the matter, they said as they saw Sly throwing away one nut after another without eating it. Bad, bad, all bad, said Sly. Why did you collect all bad nuts, you silly, stupid things? The nut hatch whistled and the mouse squealed with laughter. Silly yourself, it was you who collected that pile of nuts and gave them to us, don't you remember? And then as Sly did remember. Yes, he had picked all those bad nuts with holes in to give to the nut hatch and the field mouse. What a horrid shock he got. The nut hatch and the field mouse went off laughing. Serves you right, they cried. So Sly the squirrel had to go hungry all that winter. And if the little mouse hadn't been kind and given him a few of his own, he would have starved. And I don't think he'll play a trick like that again, do you? The roundabout man. The fair had come to town. It was in the big field at one end of the town, and the children eagerly watched all the tents being put up, and the swings and the hula hoop and everything. It was a most magnificent roundabout. There were animals to ride on, and these animals went up and down as well as round and round. If I went on, I'd ride the bear, said Joyce to her twin, Jane. What would you ride, Jane? Oh, that lovely swan, said Jane. Then I should pretend I was sailing and flying at the same time, going up and down, up and down, round and round, round and round. Oh, lovely. It's a pity Mummy's ill in hospital, said Joyce. She'd give us some money and let us go to the fair. But Auntie Nora won't, I'm sure. She never gives us a penny. No, not even when we run lots of errands for her, said Jane. Auntie Nora did not believe in giving a lot of money to children. She believed in them paying for everything themselves and saving up if they wanted anything. You have your Saturday pocket money, she said, and that should be enough. If you want anything, you must save up your pocket money for it. So, when Joyce and Jane asked if they might go to the fair, and please could they have their money, Auntie Nora said, What about your Saturday pocket money? That is given to you to spend on things like the fair. Well, Auntie, said Joyce, we haven't got any money at all till this Saturday, and then we want to spend it on something special and not at the fair. Joyce and Jane had spent their pocket money in buying clothes to take to their mum in hospital, and they meant to take her some primroses. But there were only ten pence a bunch, and each of the twins wanted a bunch each, so there wouldn't be any left. Not the penny. Auntie Nora shook her head. I can't give you any more than your pocket money, she said. I'm sorry. I don't believe in handing out money to children whenever they ask for it. You have plenty of pocket money. And there was no more to be said. Joyce and Jane turned away sadly. Now they wouldn't go to the fair, and they would never ride on that little roundabout. 
I wouldn't mind not doing anything else at the fair if only we could ride on the roundabout, Joyce said one evening. I just love the roundabout. And they were on an Edinburgh Nora, and they had all the way to go to the farm for eggs. And it was a long way, and they had to be home for supper, so they couldn't stop long to watch the fair. Then, soon, they ran off and made their way over the field to the farm. When they got there, the farmer's wife gave them the eggs and some hot biscuits. Whilst they were eating them, a little old lady came into the farmhouse kitchen. Are your children going back to town now, she asked. Yes, we are, said the twins. Well then, I wonder if you would take this parcel to my son for me, said the old lady. It's his washing. He wants clean things for tomorrow, and I haven't been able to get out today because my legs have been covered. Could you take it for me, do you think? His lodgings are at the end of the high street. Oh dear, that was a long way to go. They might be late for supper too. And Auntie Nora will be angry. Still, they must help the old lady. And if they ran all the way, they could easily do it. So the twins took the parcel of washing and went. They ran all the way, panting, taking it in turns to carry the parcel that was quite heavy, really. And when they got to the house in the high street, there was nobody in. They rang the bell and knocked loudly, but no one came. The woman next door put her head out the window and called to them, What do you want? And the twins looked at the name written on the parcel. We've got a parcel from Mr. Tom Taylor, said Jane. Oh, him. Well, you'll find him at the fair, said the woman. I think he's with the swings. Shall we take the parcel to him, said Joyce. Yes, we'd better. We can't leave it here on the doorstep. So they rushed up to the fairground at the gate and said they had a parcel from Mr. Tom Taylor. Tom! Oh, he's at the roundabout, said the, the woman at the gate. Over there, look, the man with the curly black hair. The twins went up to the curly-haired man and said, that we've got a parcel for you, and it's your washing. Well, do you want to write? He said, five pence each. No, said Joyce, we've just brought your washing. We went to the farm where your mother is staying to get some eggs, and she told us to bring the parcel to you. Well, what kind children, said Mr. Taylor. Who would have thought there were any children around who would do such a nice thing for a little old lady? Wait a minute and I'll give you five pence for your kindness. Oh no, thank you, said Joyce. We did it to help your mum. Our mum doesn't like us taking money from anybody else. Well, well, so you've got a mother as nice as yourself, have you, said the roundabout man, putting his money in his pocket. But look here, you mustn't be the only people doing that kindness. I'd like to be kind too. Have you ever been in a roundabout? No, never, said the twins. Well, we'll have a ride now, said the roundabout man. Go on, choose which animal you'd like. Oh, we'd love to, said Jane, looking longingly at the roundabout, which had just stopped. But we're awfully late, and our auntie, who's looking after us, will get cross if we're not back for supper in time. You come back tomorrow, then, said the roundabout man. Now, I won't take no for an answer. Will you promise me to come back tomorrow? Oh, we'd love to, said the twins. Thank you very much. And they ran home, and were only just in time for supper. And when they told their aunt all that had happened, she was pleased. Well, if you want to go and get your reward, you can. You were very good children to refuse the money he offered, and to come home without their rights so that you wouldn't believe. You deserve a treat. And why didn't you tell me you were spending all your pocket money and flowers for your mother? If I'd known, I would have given you some for the fair. Well, the next day, Auntie Nora gave them ten pence each, and off they went, full of delight. They paid to go in, and when they got to the roundabout, the curly-haired man greeted them joyously. Here you are, then. I've been waiting for you. I'm going to let the roundabout have a very, very long run, just for you. Choose the animals you want. Well, we can pay for a ride after all, said Joyce. We've got ten pence each. Now look here, said the roundabout man. Fair's fair. Did you let me pay you for your bit of kindness yesterday? No, you didn't. Then I shan't allow you to pay me for mine. Choose your animal. So Joyce chose the bear she wanted, and Jane chose the swan. The music began, the roundabout started up. Up and down, up and down went the bear and the swan, and round and round and round. It was the very longest roundabout ride that anyone had ever known. I wish I had been on it too, don't you? I'd have chosen the lion, I think. What would you have had? The Christmas Party 
Donald was a lonely boy, for he had no brothers or sisters, and instead of going to school, his mother taught him lessons. So he had no friends and no one to play with. He had never been to a party in all his life. At Christmas time, he used to peep into other people's windows and see the children dancing around the Christmas tree and pulling crackers, and he longed to join them, but no one ever asked him. One day, just after Christmas, Donald dressed himself and up in his red Indian suit his mother had given him for Christmas. He looked very fine in the feathers, tunic, fringe, trousers, and an enormous feathered headdress. When he looked out of the window, he saw that all the children next door were having a party. It was a fancy dress party. All the children were dressed up as fairies, clowns, milkmaids, or soldiers. Donald went out of his front door and watched the children arrive. And then he went to their gate and watched them play inside. Suddenly the door opened and a lady ran down to the gate. She took Donald's hand and pulled him to the door. Here's another little boy, she cried. He's too shy to come in. Look at his beautiful fancy dress. Donald tried to explain how he didn't, hadn't been asked to the party, but nobody would listen. Soon he found himself playing games with the other children, and then he was sitting down to a marvellous tea. After that, there was a conjurer who made a rabbit come out of a hat. Then Donald was given a trumpet and a box of chocolates from the Christmas tree. All the other children liked Donald because he was full of fun. The grown-ups liked him too, for he had good manners. Donald had never been so happy in all his life. And it was Donald who won first prize for the best Francis dress costume. But I can't take it, he said. I wasn't asked to the party, really. That lady over there pulled me in, and I'm only the little boy from next door. Well, cried the lady, we wondered who you were, but you deserve the first prize, so here it is, a clockwork tree. You must come again and play with the children some other time. Donald ran home with his first prize, and his mother was very surprised. It won't be lonely anymore, said Donald, and indeed it wasn't. Moth-eaten toy dog. You look dreadful, said the collie to the toy dog. I can't help it, said the poor dog. I didn't know that moths were getting into my fur and eating it all the way to the patches. Nobody told me. Now what am I to do? You could ask Pip and Jinky the Pixies if they could help you, said the bear. They're clever and they might think of something. The dog wouldn't go to ask Pip and Jinky. I'm so ashamed of being out of doors, he said. So the golly went to tell the Pixies all about him. I don't know what you can do for the brown furry coat, he said. It really is dreadful. Can you possibly patch it up with something? I can't think of anything at the moment, said Pip, unless Auntie Twinkle would let me cut up her old fur coat. Certainly not, said Aunt Twinkle at once. We'll go back and tell the dog I'll bring something along tomorrow. And off he went to find Jinky. They did think of something. I know, said Pip. What about this furry caterpillar, Jinky? You know, they eat and they eat and they split the furry skins. They burst right out of them and leave them on the grass. Couldn't we ask for some? They'd be just the right colour for Patch's coat. So they asked the furry caterpillars to save them the lots of skins. Did them up in a bundle and took them to the toys. Now stand still, dog, said Pip, and I will glue these little bits onto that moth eaten coat of yours. So they did, and it took them quite a long time, but they made a wonderful job of it. You couldn't possibly tell that the dog's coat was partly made of caterpillar fur. Pip and Jinky are clever little pixies. Spiky the Hedgehog Spiky lived in a farm under an old chicken shed. He was very friendly with all the other animals on the farm. Sometimes he would have to cross a busy road, and he was very slow, and he would have to wait for ages to get across. Before he crossed the road, he always looked right, then left, and right again. When he came back from seeing his friends, he would have to remember the road sense, otherwise a car would have knocked him down. One day, Spikey was walking along the fields when he met Mr. Moe, who had just come to the top of the ground to see where he was. He had been burrowing for a long time, and he wanted to stay on this farm, as most of his friends lived there. Mr. Mole said, Hello, Spikey. It's been a long time since we've had a good chat. 
And then he told old Spikey that he had seen wicked Freddy Mouse eating some of the farm must come. And then, do you know what he did next? No, said Spikey. Well, said Mr. Mole, he went into the bales of straw and chewed through the string that was holding them together. And Freddy Mouse is going to get himself into trouble if he's not careful. I know, said Mr. Mole. Mr. Mole always knew what was going on in the farm, and you might say he was the local gossip. Spikey said, Goodbye, Mr. Mole, and went on walking across the field. The grass was very long, and it was almost haymaking time, so Spikey had to be very careful, for if one of the farmer's machines ran into him, he would be badly hurt. Just then, Spikey realised he had come out of the long grass, and a tractor was coming down the field mowing the grass. Spikey went as fast as he could along the grass, but it was very hard for him to walk on his little feet. They stuck in it, and the tractor was getting closer and closer, and Spikey thought he was going to be run over, but the farmer saw him and stopped the tractor. He got off and walked over to Spikey and picked him up and carried him over the hedge where he would be safe. The farmer said, Spikey, you will be safe now, and then went back to his tractor to get on with his work. Spikey thought he was very lucky and decided to walk around the field by the hedge and out of the way of the farmer's tractor. Spikey liked the summer because of the warm sun and the very long days. In the winter, he would have to hibernate out of the cold. Spikey walked back to the old chicken shed where he lived and on the way he met Mark the cockerel. Mark told Spikey that he was going to leave the farm and go to one of his friends for a holiday. So off Spikey went to his little home. The next morning, he came out to see what the weather was doing, and as it looked like rain, he decided to stay close to the farm. He went down to the milking shed to have a drink of milk, as it was time for the cows to be milked anyway. The milk was put in big tanks to be taken away, and the cowman who was milking the cows was very fond of Spanky, and he always put a saucer of milk down for him. And when he had finished his milk, he would pick some of the cow's food off the floor. The cowman was always very kind to Spikey and all the other farm animals. When Spikey had finished eating, the cowman would put him in the yard and Spikey would go back to his home to sleep in his bed of dry leaves. The Clever Seagull There was once a seagull flying along over the beach when he came to a sandcastle. Please may I rest on it for a while, said the seagull in a very miserable voice. The sandcastle answered, you may if you wish. Our feathered friend knew that something was wrong, so he alighted, put his head under his wing, and listened. Sandcastle told him how two children had started to build him in the morning when their mummy called him for lunch, and they never came back. He had heard them say what a beautiful castle he was going to be, with a turret and a moat and everything. It was very thoughtless of him to return to make him finished. It was very sad. Seagull said, do not look so forlorn. I will think of something. He stood on top of the sandcastle and with his strong beak scooped up all the sand, piling it high and making a grand turret. Then he hopped down from the top and walked around the castle. The circles and everything else, his footprints made such an attractive moat. Now he thought, I will fly all around, touching it with my wingtips. This will make it look very special and I will get some pretty shells in my beak and drop them just at the front entrance. Then, because he was a very nice eagle, he took from his tail the longest feather and stood it on the top. The next day, some important looking people came along and stopped at the sand castle, and one said, It's different. Such a lovely idea. Then someone said, I like it, a lady said. It's the best one I have seen, and took from the envelope a yellow flag and stood it on the sandcastle right in front of everyone. And on the flag it said, first prize. The man who came along with a camera to take a photograph said, I wonder who did it. There's no one here. The camera went click, click and took a lovely picture for all the people and the newspapers to see. They saw a happy sandcastle on the beach. Pretty pebbles and shells, waves lapping the shore, and standing there, a beautiful seagull. The forgetful seagull. Good morning, seagull. Good morning, little girl. Gina and the seagull were very good friends and often had a chat in the back garden before she went to school. She would not be going today as it was Saturday. 
"Hooray! and a very special Saturday it was, too." "What are you doing to day, little girl?" said the sea gull. Gina was quite cross with him for not remembering. All the week she had been telling him why to day was very special. Every one else remembered. The postman had brought lots of birthday cards with seven on it. As it was such a lovely age to be, Mummy said that she could invite friends to have a birthday party. Mummy had also made a beautiful cake with seven candles on, and "Happy Birthday, Gina" was pink icing. After tea, when she had blown out all the candles, every one would have a piece of cake. Our little girl went on to say, "I expect my friends will all bring me presents. I love that. Not like you, Seagull. You didn't even remember it was my birthday." Poor Seagull was very upset. People had such funny ways. Who ever heard of giving presents for a birthday? It made him very sad that he had not known, and his little friend was disappointed with him. Still, it was only ten o'clock in the morning, and a lovely June day. He must fly around and put her in his thinking cap. Gina was such a dear little girl, and often gave him nice things to eat in the winter when he was hungry. Perhaps he would have an idea for the party after all. So he flew over a playing field where some people were busy getting ready for a fete. There were lots of heat trap passes, all ready for something called a lucky dip. Would you believe it? Our seagull started to get a lovely thought. Supposing he swooped down and picked up just one parcel, surely no one would mind. Of course, it would not be fair to take a parcel without paying, but he did know where there was a lost corner on the beach. I will go and search for it, he thought. Which is exactly what he did. Seagull found the coin right behind a big white pebble. Then carrying it in his beak, he dropped it on the table near the parcels. Did you see that? said the lady in charge of the lucky dip and quickly put the money in her tray. Seagull flew off with the parcel in his beak and he went back to Gina's house and dropped it on her doorstep. He tapped tap very loudly with his beak on the door because his children were making a lot of noise. The music was being played and he seemed to be singing Happy Birthday to You. He joined in with the singing outside, of course. Daddy hurried home from the football match because he wanted to be in time for the party and said, There's another parcel on the doorstep. Mummy said, One of Gina's friends must have left it. Gina opened it very carefully because it was beautifully wrapped in pretty paper and inside was a lovely musical doll. Exactly what she had always wanted. Later, a little girl said, I will go outside and take a piece of cake to my friend. Mummy said, I thought they had all gone. Gina said, No, my very best friend is still there. Mummy looked out of the window and thought that surely her little girl must be daydreaming, for there was no one there, only a seagull sitting on the garden gate. Here are some poems. The first one's called The Friendly Toad. I am a toad, a friendly thing. I eat your slugs and flies. I know I'm ugly, brown and squat, but have you seen my eyes? Just look at them, like jewels rare gleaming in my head. I watch you with them as I sit upon your garden bed. Please like me, little boy or girl. I can't help how I grew. I've got to be a toad, you know, and you've got to be you. I'd like to be a lighthouse. I'd like to be a lighthouse, all scrubbed and painted white. I'd like to be a lighthouse and stay awake all night. To keep my eye on everything that sails my patch of sea. I'd like to be a lighthouse with ships all watching me. I went fishing. I went fishing, took some bait, didn't go early, didn't go late. Caught eight fishes in my pail, seven were mackerel, but the eight was a whale. The seven were easy to put into the tin, but that will cause me trouble before I packed them in. Took my catch home. What did Mother say? Get your safe fish out of here. We're having sausages today. Cats. Cats sleep anywhere, any table, any chair. Top of piano, window ledge, in the middle, on the edge. Open drawer, empty shoe, anybody's lap will do. Fitted in a cardboard box, in the cupboard with your frocks. Anywhere, they don't care. Cats sleep anywhere. This story is called The Great Big Bone. Once upon a time, as I was out walking, I smelt a glorious smell. I stopped and sniffed. It was a smell of bone and it came from the hedge. Tails and whiskers I walked to myself. It must be a great big bone to have such a great smell. So I ran to find it. 
and just exactly at the same moment as I came from my side of the hedge, another dog, much smaller than I, ran to get the bone from the other side of the hedge. It's my bone, I growled. No, it's mine, growled the other dog. He took one end and I took the other and we snarled like the beginning of a thunderstorm. It was a wonderful bone with meat on it and it certainly had a lovely smell. Do you know, dog, I believe this bone's bad, suddenly said the other dog to me and he dropped his end and began to sniff along it. It's been here for a long time and I shouldn't be surprised if it's poisonous now. Once I ate a poisoned fish head and I was dreadfully ill, I couldn't wag my tails for three weeks. I dropped my end too and sniffed. That bone had a glorious smell, but it certainly was very strong indeed. I wondered if it could be bad. I can tell you I didn't want to lose the wag out of my tail, but it's too useful. Shall I taste the bone and see if it's all right, said the little dog. If you like, I said. So the dog ran his tongue over it and bit a piece of meat off, and he then whisked the tails. He suddenly rolled over and over. He had a dreadful yelp and a pay of pain and woof. Oh, fetch help, please, fetch help, I'm poisoned. I was frightened, I can tell you. Lie there, dog, I said, I'll go and fetch my mistress. She will know what to do. Oh, quick, quick, groaned the little dog, rolling over and over. Oh, who would have thought that bone was so poisonous? I rushed off as fast as my four paws could go, and I hunted everywhere for the mistress, but I couldn't find her. Come quickly, I begged her. There's a poor little dog in great pain. They're eating our poisoned bone. So Mistress put on her coat and hurried off with me to find the little dog. I scurried to the hedge, but wags and whistles. Would you believe it? There was no little dog there, and no bone either. They were both gone. And all that was left was a wonderful old father who smelled the bone. He was too little to fight for that bone, chuckled a robin in the hedge, but quite big enough to trick you. Ah, dear children, I had to wag my tail all day because I was so upset. Just wait till I meet that little dog again. The horse, the horse, and the donkey. Once upon a time, a red ripe apple fell from an old apple tree into the ditch below. Plop it went and lay there bright and glowing. The brown horse that lived in a field saw it and galloped up to it eagerly, for he loved an apple. But someone else had seen it too, and that someone was a wasp, striped in yellow and black. The wasp had found few apples, for it was a bad year for the fruit. So when she saw this juicy red one, she was delighted. She flew down to it just exactly at the same time as the brown horse galloped up to eat it. It's mine, buzzed the wasp angrily. I saw it first, near the horse in a rage. I'll sting you and eat my apple, said the wasp. And the horse saw her long sting quivering at the end of her body. I'll eat you and the apple too if you dare to suck the juice, cried the horse, who was longing to munch the red apple. Now, now, what's all this, said another voice as it trotted up to the grey donkey. What are you quarrelling about? Can I help you settle the quarrel? You, cried the horse and the wasp together. Who would have heard of a stupid donkey settling a quarrel? You haven't enough brains. The donkey didn't seem to mind their rudeness. Well, tell me what your quarrel is all about. So the horse told him, and the donkey flipped his long tail and brayed with laughter. How foolish you both are, he said. You could easily settle your quarrel if you would do what I say. Why don't you both go to the other end of the field, and then, starting off together, see who can reach the apple first? Whoever wins the race has the apple. Oh, that seems a good idea, said the horse, who felt certain he could race the wasp. I agree, said the wasp, who was sure he could fly faster than a clumsy old horse could run. Off you go then to the end of the field, said the donkey. When I bray, start to run. Horse and wasp fly. The two went off, and the wasp was buzzing excitedly, and the horse flicking his tail. When they reached the end of the field, the donkey lifted up his head and brayed loudly. At once this horse began to gallop and the wasp began to fly at top speed. They arrived at the ditch at the very same moment. But what a strange thing, the apple was gone. Yes, no matter where they looked, it wasn't there. They looked round for the donkey and he was gone too. 
the gate was open and there was no sign of that little green donkey. He wasn't so stupid as he looked, said the horse suddenly. No, said the horse angrily. We were the stupid ones. We could easily have shared that apple between us. Now there is none to share. I know why that dun donkey had dis disappeared. Oh, so do I. Do you? These are 